Right, good evening all. Um, I think I'm recording. Yeah, I must be. Um, anyway, um, what I've had to do, I'm using my little Panasonic uh, 5.1, supposed to be 5.1 surround sound, but in this instance it doesn't really matter because I could use any camera with this recording because uh, this is a recording of the very famous record producer Joe Meek who produced Telstar Johnny remember me etc so let me just make sure this is recording I don't want to talk to myself you know, yeah it is right and um, so what I've done uh, this is a as I said it's a very 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 old recording of Joe Meek and he was interviewed or he actually made the interview himself on some very old tape uh, so you have to excuse the distortion there's a lot of distortion right which is not the fault of the machine or the um, amp or anything like that as you know it sounds absolutely perfect you know if I record something like Pink Floyd or whatever but it's uh, it's about half an hour long and it's called uh, Joe Meek Remembers and he actually tells you in detail all the equipment he used in the studio he actually used those quad 2 amps which is really good. I've got one of those actually, but um, yeah, another thing to demonstrate one day. But um, yeah, yeah, I think he, had, he said he had tannoys, and anyway, describes in detail all the equipment he had in the studio: Vortexing machine, which I've got, Brunel's machine, Brunel machines, which I've got. Yeah, what else have I got? Oh my god, I need a bigger house. But anyway, let's uh, let's let Joe uh, talk all about it. And as I said, I apologise in advance for the distortion and the quality of the recording. It's bad, OK? And I've set it to uh, three and three quarters now because I didn't know, you know, if that tape would last on there on seven and a half inches per second. But it doesn't really matter because it's audio anyhow. So anyway, I'm going to um, record this. I'm going to finish my coffee off. So uh, let me start this off and uh, enjoy it's about half an hour long so if you you know if you're interested in joe meek and you like to hear what he was up to in the studio and uh, what equipment he had this you'll find it's very interesting but try to listen to it carefully and turn the volume up as much as you can because it's very hard to um, understand some bits of it i try to clean it up a little bit with audacity but you know that software but i didn't want to go mad on it i like to keep things as original as possible I tried to lower the volume slightly because it was distorting, but it wasn't that at all. It was just just the way it's been recorded. But anyway, I uh, hope you enjoyed this. Um, I enjoyed it immensely. I must admit, it was brilliant. Right, I'm going to briefly jump out of the way. Right, let's turn it on. You ready? Let's go. And I hope the battery in this camcorder lasts because I charged it for about 10 minutes. How long have I got? Oh, I might just make half an hour if I'm lucky. Anyway, let's see. Enjoy. Well, I tried to start at the beginning and then bring you right up to date with my present activities making pop records for the commercial market. Um, I was about five years old when I first wanted a gramophone, and it was one of those toy gramophones with a celluloid sound box and a key to wind it up. And I remember I see it in the shop window and I'd asked for it for Christmas. And as quite often happens, my wish came true and I got this gramophone for Christmas with some children's records. Well, I used to play this all the time and it was quite obvious to my parents that this fascinated me. And when I was seven years old, they bought me a proper gramophone uh, the portable type uh, that you see very popular, that, well, 20 years ago. And uh, uh, at this time, uh, I used to be fascinated with uh, making things out of shoeboxes, like puppet shows and slot machines and all sorts of things. And uh, I used to try and experiment with my gramophone, and I discovered if you play the record at the end on the run out groove, you could shout down the sound chamber and the sound would be imprinted in the grooves. And I thought that I discovered something marvelous. And of course, 
I was really doing just what um, Edison had discovered years before. But anyway, this became not only a hobby, but uh, it used to take up most of my time. I used to go around old record shops in Gloucester and old sales room and buy up lots of gramophone records, a lot of which I still have at home in my attic. <laughs> I'll tell you more about that later. Anyway, uh, this went on until I was about 13 years old and uh, discovered uh, that uh, it had changed over to uh, what was a magnetic pickup, which I connected to the gramophone. And uh, uh, then I discovered uh, that I wanted to amplify this. And I, I made my first one valve radio. And then, of course, my one valve, first one valve amplifier. And by the time I was about 14, I sold my treasured possession, a cine camera, and I bought my first amplifier, seven pound ten, I remember. And the war was on at this time, and uh, I used to play records for dancing too, mainly with Sylvester and different things, uh, different records that were very popular then. And I think this is when it be uh, I began to get an ear for the type of music the public liked, something with a good, solid rhythm and uh, with a tune forced home. And um, I also naturally began to collect a lot of radio gear and and I soon found that my entertainment with gramophone records became very popular around Gloucestershire and uh, I was in pretty big demand. Uh, at one time, uh, to such an extent that I used to have to employ some other friends of mine uh, to operate gear, say on an August back holiday they would be at country, I'd be in Gloucester, somebody else would be at Newham. And um, uh, the same, this, by this time I was about 16, I used to provide music for amateur dramatic societies. I remember a play like The Ghost Train and uh, uh, Oh, The Portuguese, and lots of plays, and I used to go out of my way to provide the right sort of music for them and the right sound effects. Uh, my father was an estate agent and naturally wanted me to to be the same, but uh, I, my head was always in radio books and audio books, and uh, uh, so they used to let me work in a radio shop in my spare time. And then I went in the forces when I was 18 and uh, became a radar mechanic. And my two years in the RAF was taken up by learning as much as possible about radar. And also, I was pretty happy around the camp at repairing radios and uh, uh, record players. When I came out, uh, in the meantime, my father had died, I decided that I must take the plunge and move to London and take a job uh, connected with recording. Because during my time in the services, I experimented with wire recorders and uh, uh, disc cutting. And, uh, this really fascinated me more than anything else. And so I came to London and took a job for one week in a, a film dubbing room, which I must say I disliked because there was nothing creative in it. And I left this to take a job in Stone's radio shop in Edgware Road. And uh, I kept this job for two months. Then I saw the International Broadcasting Corporation were advertising for an engineer a TV engineer. So I went along and I discovered it was uh, operating a closed circuit television setup. Uh, this was before commercial TV had started. And I took the job. After about a couple of weeks, I was invited to go on one of the Luxembourg shows, People Are Funny, which was then uh, the chief engineer was Tig Rowe, who's now at Associated Rediffusion, I believe. And uh, after a couple of weeks, uh, I, was, I was put in charge of the show itself. Um, of course, this was a great honor for me, and I really did work extremely hard to keep the standard of recording up. 
which at times is extremely difficult. And uh, by the way, this is when I first met Mr. Orders, who would come along to a show at Torquay to take some particulars. And uh, I remember we had a, a long, long discussion about the different gear we were using. Well, at the same time, uh, when I arrived back in London in a week, I was put on some uh, pop recording sessions. Uh, the first one, I believe, was for Pi. It was uh, Ted Hockridge record. And uh, uh, about my third recording became a hit. It was uh, uh, by Frankie Vaughan. It was called Green Door. Uh, after that, Phillips used to use me almost entirely, and also Pi, and I built up quite a reputation of being able to record pop records. Uh, this coupled with my weekend activities of the show just to keep me terribly busy, and uh, it got to the stage where I began to feel that um, I had reached about as far as I could get at IBC. And one day, Dennis Preston suggested would I like to work with him well, Dennis Preston is an independent disc producer and uh, uh, had with artists like Ackerville, Chris Farber, Mike Preston. And uh, after a little bit of thought, I, I decided to take the job with him. And uh, he had a small office then in Denmark Street. I found a small room in Newman Street with, and bought an old magnifier editing machine. And I spent most of my time editing the recordings we made at IBC. They were Lonnie Donegan hits and Johnny Duncan and well, what a stream really. I, I recorded Teddy Fleur and uh, Val Penny Blues, all the Donegan hits. And the list of uh, actual hits I recorded reaches about 40. Um, this is in the last four years. Well, um, I then wrote a song called Put Around Her Finger, which was quite a big hit here and also in America and brought me in quite a lot of money. And with this, I decided that I'd like to try and start my own record company. Now, this may seem ridiculously ambitious, but I'd made up my mind, and so I did it. And uh, it was called Triumph, and uh, uh, I took a partner called Baron Scoop. Well, he was a very classically minded person, and um, uh, we never really saw eye to eye. I'm completely pop minded and uh, uh, like to cater for the teenage market. Well, the uh, fourth record, which was Angela Jones by Michael Cox, became a hit, and this is where the problem started. We discovered that we, we didn't have enough money to carry on pressing this record. And uh, so we had difficulties, but anyway, it got to number four. And then um, I discovered that uh, things were being misused in different ways, and that I was advised to, to leave the company and try and start up again on my own. Well, this, of course, was impossible because by this time all my money had gone, and uh, so I decided to paper partner by the name of Major Banks, who was also with me to this very day. And I started a company called RGM Sam. Well, um, the difficulty was uh, finding premises to make the recordings because I realized using other independent studios were very expensive. And uh, in the end, I found this building in Holloway Road, which gave me three floors. Uh, the ground floor is occupied by a leather shop had a good shop and uh, uh, well I decided this was a place for me so I moved the small amount of gear that I had in and uh, talked to Major Bank and described the sort of things I wanted and uh, 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 and ended up with the equipment that I'm using today um, I'll describe first of all the studio itself um, it's on the third floor, and it's the size of an average bedroom, no larger. Uh, I've covered the walls with acoustic tiles, all the walls except one, 
which is covered with uh, a thick cut. Uh, this has very good absorbent power, and the studio is extremely dense. Um, the floor is carpeted, and the ceiling is completely covered in tiles. And only the one wall has a few tiles missing, and this gives me a certain amount of brightness. And, uh, but basically, it's completely dead. I have a, uh, no playback speaker in the studio, and no cue lights. I have a piano, which I've put drawing in, in the pads it produces a, a more metallic sound, which is much better to record, and it's much more suitable for pop records. Um, the microphone, the cables lead straight down to my control room, which is about the size of a small bedroom. Well, it actually was a small bedroom, I should imagine. And uh, in this control room, I, I have a sort of desk with the equipment piled on it, and I have a table and, and a rack. But uh, let's go back to the studio, and uh, I'll describe the microphones. The main microphones uh, are two U47s. I think this is a wonderful microphone, and I use it for all my vocalists. It has a, a very good characteristic for uh, for close work, that is for a vocalist uh, and uh, uh, instruments that you need a lot of presence on. And uh, to help this, I've, uh, I use a small piece of foam plastic. Uh, this stops pops and bangs when I hope this work close to it. Uh, I did have a um, um, a stereo condenser microphone, uh, the SM2, but uh, this has broken down on me. I believe it has a habit of doing this. First the one side went, then the other, and to be quite truthful, I haven't mended it recently because uh, it didn't really stand out any more than the, the microphones I'm using. The others are uh, AKG mic, the small microphones, uh, dynamic types that uh, are very popular today. I have about six of those. Um, I have uh, also a couple of res lows. I use one on the bass drum and uh, uh, one sometimes for a vocal group, working on both sides of it. Uh, really, the microphones aren't all that expensive, but they're very efficient. And uh, uh, being such a small studio, they're used pretty close to the instruments. And uh, uh, later in the other control room, I add echo to different channels. And uh, uh, this way I get what I feel is a more commercial sound than to get the instruments to balance themselves in the studio. Anyway, uh, we go to the control room now. And uh, the main recorder machine is a Lyric twin track, Lyric. Uh, I usually record the voice on one track and the backing on the other. Uh, the other recorder is a TR-51, and this I use for dubbing. And I must say it's turned to add to be a marvelous little machine. But uh, I would prefer to change it soon for something like an Ampex, which would possibly be a little more reliable. This machine tends to uh, pop just a little bit. Sometimes you, you get sort of bumping in the background. I think it's to do with the violin. The, um, um, the mixer is a varied selection. I have a homemade mixer, which is about four channels with top lips on each. Then I use a Vortexin mixer, uh, which is a pretty good solid job and uh, the sort of thing that you leave and sort of forget that it is. That would be very useful for me. And then I use a Vortexian uh, tape recorder for uh, delaying the echo. Uh, this is me tape delay echo, which I use. Then above my control room, I have a room which I've made into an echo chamber. And it's quite remarkable for the size of it. It's really 
Mm -hmm. uh, very, very good actual sound, which is on all my records. And also, uh, I use electronic echo, which I have a patent on. It's my own invention. And uh, uh, this is used quite a lot on my records, too, especially on guitars and uh, percussive sounds. Uh, the vocal mic goes through a little cooker I've made, which has got the top of middle lift in it. Uh, it was a, originally a small amplifier. It has three channels, so I can mix in a vocal group with it and uh, possibly the front line instrument. And this is on top of the, the Lyrex, one of the um, amplifiers, and uh, it's quite handy. I can mix when without having to walk about the, the control room too much. Uh, the speaker is a tenor dual concentric in a block of cabinet, that's how they use it most studios today. I also have the same type of speaker downstairs so I can play my acetate and record through, make sure they're cut properly and with the standards well up. I've also got in my control room for the, the second channel, the vocal channel, I have another tannoy speaker cabinet, a smaller type that fit into a corner. I don't know the model. But this I find rather metallic, and I only use at low levels. Uh, I can't really balance on it. Uh, I've tried, but it just, I just can't seem to get a balance on it. It has a, a seem to have an artificial top lip that rather misleads you. Well, uh, I service my own gear. I have a, an advanced oscillator, and uh, a small oscilloscope, uh, the type you can pick up for 15 pounds. Um, uh, the oscillator is very important. Uh, I quite often use it on uh, sound effects on some of my records. Um, I have some bits of gear that uh, you don't usually find with the team recording, recordist. And that is an old BBC limiter, which I use on the voice track quite often. Um, it is very ancient. It's got the old large pin, large bass type valve. It must be at least 30 years old. But it is very efficient and uh, isn't all that noticeable in its operation. Then I have a, a compressor which I built myself. Uh, I found the design in one of the uh, magazines and uh, it works very, very efficiently, very quickly. Um, I have also, um, uh, for the electric base, I feed this through an equalizer unit. And, uh, and on this unit, I've experimented and I've, uh, I feed the output back. I believe it's possible feedback. But when carefully done and through a choke, it gives you the effect of the string being plucked, you get sort of a metallic pluck of the string itself. I don't always use it, but on the outlaws records, I use it. Well, uh, I think that describes pretty accurately the equipment. Oh, by the way, I, I feed my output to the speakers to quad amplifiers. They're a wonderful amplifier. Um, I also use a quad downstairs for playing my record. I think now it would be a good idea if I describe to you a rather typical day in my life. Um, it starts about 9.30, the phone begins to ring merrily away, and uh, it's a combination of publishers ringing up to tell me the songs they have, and uh, or agents asking when their artist records are coming out, or when the artist should arrive at my place to make a recording. And, uh, well, various other things. As a rule, most days I have some form of recording to do. Um, we we'll say today I'm going to make a record with a new artist. It's been brought around to me and I feel has potential. I've auditioned him and he has a different sound and voice. And I feel has uh, the sort of looks that could appeal to the public. And I've decided to make a record with him. 
he signed his contract, which is for one year with an option of further two. And um, the musicians are beginning to arrive. On this occasion, I'm using the Outlaws as the basic rhythm group, and uh, mainly because they're top-rate musicians and uh, about to know exactly what I want in the studio. Well, the artist has his microphone, a 47, in the corner of the studio, screened off from the rest of the musicians, and he can sing his heart out without anybody taking any notice of it. Uh, he's gone on to a separate track. The bass is fairly direct. The guitars have microphones in front of their amplifiers. The drums have about two or three microphones sometimes placed around it. And uh, uh, I then, uh, each musician has been given the chord sequence for the song or has been listening to a record downstairs on my player uh, and have dotted down the chords. And then we go ahead and uh, we record until I have a very good track. I'm not worried about whether the, the artist is singing in tune or phrasing properly. I have a very good rhythm track. And uh, for the A side, and we do the same for the B side. And then, uh, that's all for the rhythm group. Off they go. And I then dub the artist's voice on again. I listen to the tracks you've already got. Sometimes these are good enough. But as a rule, he wears earphones and the tracks play back to him. And it's dubbed onto my TR51. So we have voice and rhythm tracks. Uh, it's during this recording that I produced the artist, and this possibly is one of the most important things in making a pop record, to make him sound new, a new voice, different phrasing, to bring out the personality on the record. When this is done, I phone up Ivor Raymond, who I think is a brilliant arranger and I use for most of my recordings, and uh, tell him that I would like him to come along and listen tracks I've got. By this time I have about three records for him to arrange for. He comes along and we play them over. I describe what I would like here, there, and the type of sound I want. Uh, he goes away with the tracks and the voice and uh, arranges for it. Sometimes he uses four strings, never anymore, four violins, uh, say a French horn and a harp. And sometimes it require three girls. Well, um, he phones me up in a couple of days and tells me that it's ready, that he's arranged it, and uh, I can book, uh, can he book the musician? I say, okay, and we fix up the time that's convenient for both of us, and they all arrive on the scene. Now, when this, when I first started recording here, I used to get a lot of leg calls from these musicians who are, who are top musicians that, and often are playing in Mandelbaum's orchestra and classical orchestras and, and well, are really the, the cream of the musicians. And they used to come in and they used to look around and they'd say, well, where do you want me? Am I supposed to be in the bathroom? Uh, but after they heard a playback, uh, I don't usually get any more criticism. They, they, they realize the presence there is on their mu instruments and that they've really got to be on form, otherwise it will show up in the recording. The method I use for recording strings is to have the microphone pretty close to them. Uh, the four of them sit two opposite each other. And uh, then the signal I delay with the head of the vortexes. I feed this back in again, which adds a reflection, uh, which in a way gives you eight strings. And on this, I put uh, my echo chamber sound and also some of my electronic echoes. And this way I seem to get a, a very big string sound and uh, a very commercial sound. Um, uh, the, the other instruments are, are recorded pretty ordinary, really. I, I do add quite a lot of top sometimes to the harp and uh, a lot of echo, of course, to the French horn. Uh, anyway, after I've finished, I've ended up by dubbing a, from my TR-51 onto my twin-track machine, my Lyrae. I have 
the extra orchestra on one side and the voice and the trap on the other. And that's all I do with my premises. I then edit out the best tapes, uh, go along to IBC and mold them together. Um, then at the same time, they cut me an after tape, which is sent along to the major major record company, say it's DMI. Um, this I usually do about Friday. On the Monday and Tuesday, I have a meeting, and the sales staff and the directors listen to the records and decide what they want to release, and the amount of posts it's given. I'm pretty fortunate as a rule. They phone me up and say, could I send the master tape along if it's coming out in three weeks' time? Could they have the biography and photographs of the artist and the label information? Well, all this I give them on the dot because I have nobody working for me and uh, um, I keep the information in my head. And of course, this, um, this means that uh, Less things go wrong, and it's up to me to push that record and try and make it a hit. Uh, quite often, also, I've, I've written one of the songs. Um, and uh, uh, then it's, when we have a release date pretty near, I get up to the manager of the artist and, uh, and different people, and we all go to town to try and plug it and uh, make the public want to buy it. Um, I have quite a lot of artists sound to me. Uh, in the last year, I've made over 60 hit records in the studio. I made the John Layton hits, John Remember Me, Wild Wind, and the My Very Tribute to Buddy Holly. Then, of course, there's the Moon Trekkers, Night of the Vampire, and uh, uh, Danny Rivers, Can't You Hear My Heart, Ian Gregory's Can't You Hear the Beat of a Broken Heart. And then, of course, up came Tell Star, and at this moment, just gone into the charts, is Peter J. and Jay Walker's doing Tam Tam 62. So altogether, it's about eight hits I've had, which when you come to consider, it comes out of a small bedroom. Uh, well, it makes you wonder why all this money is spent on these great big studios that look marvelous, but quite often don't really produce the results. I've always said that um, uh, it's not what you got it the way that you use it. Um, I have uh, developed a recording technique uh, to suit myself. Nobody really tells me what to do. They never used to when I recorded for the Lips and Pie. I produced a sound that, that, that suited my mind. And this is what I do today. And quite often after I've made a recording with an artist, I'll put a long page and I'll say, Ooh, is my voice forward enough? Or, ooh, um, I don't like the sound of that. But this just falls off my back. I just ignore it because, um, well, if I listen to those people, I possibly would produce a pretty dreary record <laughs> with all voice and no back in. And uh, you know, it's it's very difficult, very difficult thing to to say exactly what makes a hit record. Uh, because I've come up with quite a few, I'd be rather silly to listen to other people and change it and keep on the same path I'm going. There are some things that I would like very much for my studio. I would like a decent compressor and a, a, a really good curve bender. But these, um, these things cost a lot of money. Um, I think the company is making quite a lot of money, but I'm sure it uh, answers in and have these things. And then one day I'm going to take all of the gear out of the control room and build it all again neatly and uh, I'll get my outtakes down in the machine. And uh, I think then my recordings will be possibly cleaner and uh, because through the process of dubbing it three times uh, onto a machine that I don't really think is quite understandable as well as if you want. Uh, you tend to add a little fuzziness and do them at a lot each time. As a matter of fact, with my dubbing, it seems to add top and lose the bass register. Well, anyway, um, I think that's about all I can describe. Um, in my studio, uh, 
thank you once again for giving me this opportunity. If there is anything else, I can help you with Please let me know. Right, there we go. <laughs> right, I'm back. I had to go out the room because I wanted to keep quiet. Is this still recording? Let me just check. Oh, oh, the battery's down on the red. Right, okay, I better hurry up then. Good God, it's getting low. Right, so I hope you enjoyed that. And that was uh, one of my recording heroes, Joe Meek. Absolutely brilliant, com you know, not composer, he was a producer, whatever, record producer. But there we go. Hope you found that interesting. Um, I know that the quality wasn't brilliant, but I, I really can't help that. It's the best I can do. I mean, you know, as I said, the tapes are really, really old, and I've transcribed it onto this machine. Uh, it should have been on the Brunel, really, because that's more suited for the time period. But there we go. Okay, right, I better stop this uh, bloody thing before it runs out of battery. Oh yeah, I've got to change the meter still on this, so uh, I think one day next week the whole front's coming off. And let me stop this one, I've got it running. There we go. Yeah, so I've got to swap the meters over, or I'm going to try to repair these meters, because they're, they're quite expensive to buy, actually. I also have a supplier in Switzerland, but since we come out of the European Union, the prices have gone sky high. Well, not for the actual item, they're charging a fortune for delivery, which is crazy and VAT and customs and all that crap so I'm going to try to repair them I don't really want to throw them away but anyway let me, is it still recording yeah it's still going just about god right I hope you enjoy that and um, I'm going to take this memory card out and stick it on the PC and up, upload it to YouTube so there we go right I hope you enjoyed all that uh, listening to that and um, I'll sure talk to you all later right let's turn this camera off bye for now